हरि 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 हेलो माय फ्रेंड्स एस यू मोस्ट प्रोबेबली ऑलरेडी हियर विल हैव अ बिट हैमरिंग एंड अदर साउंड्स फ्रॉम द नियर बाय कंस्ट्रक्शन बट आई होप इट डजंट डिस्टर्ब टू मच This morning I remembered a situation when I was still in Amma's ashram in the cage. There, somebody visited it, and he had read a interview that I have been giving before I went the second time to, into the cage, telling there. how atma vichara was my main approach for a long time and then it changed it, again the yogic part was being activated that i included being aware of the breath and with the breath also being aware of the energy and then one man came to me and said oh werner you have come down so much <laughs> and i have heard similar comments repeatedly the people who have thought ah, i'm on the highest approach then doing again things like being aware of the breath and being busy with energy is that's way below that but then why have i come down like this this is just a misconception one person once told me but ramana maharshi said at the end everybody has to come to atma vichara and i told him yes but that doesn't mean that everybody has to start to ask who am i <laughs> it simply means that somehow or other we have to come back to the self and then whether we call it atma or whether we call it brahma or whether we call it god or whatever it does matter somehow we have to come back to that it's not that everybody has to start to do the self inquiry with the question who am i it's just one way and people have that notion this is the highest way well other people who do something else they have the also the notion what they are doing is the highest way and i just i talked about it last time but i just want to repeat there is no such a thing that which comes natural that is the highest way and the purpose of our practice is to bring the attention back to that sense of presence and this that is being done by being aware of the breath then this is equally valid like doing atma vichara if it is done by devotion it is equally valid like atma vichara what matters is whether we go about sincerely whether we really 
want to let go of all that that is troubling, that prevents us from being consciously connected. We are always connected, but to be consciously connected is that the sense. If we sincerely, sincerely go about it, it doesn't matter at all what kind of help that we are using. And for a long time, for, in my story, it was mainly the jnana approach, atma vichara, not so much the question, but more just trying to be with that sense of I am. Doing some yoga beside, some pranayamas, having a mantra from Mama and having that devotional relationship with her at the other side. But the active approach was mainly Atma Vichara, and at a certain point it shifted, that the focus shifted more to the breath and with the breath to the life force. And in that way, consciously connecting with being alive, with being conscious, with being here now in that timelessness. It needed just a little, little push from Amma that I dared to take that step, that I myself could let go of that notion. Oh, maybe it's not the highest approach. The highest approach is Atma Vishal. And then I went into that, and this is really my natural thing. It has been the central thing since then. And it is still. The first manifestation, the first expression of that divine mystery has those three aspects, consciousness, energy, and love. And we can pick out one of the three, make that our favorite, our main approach, our main connection, and the others, if we are sincere about it, come automatically along. We can also, from the beginning, have a combined practice, simultaneously connecting, focusing on energy, on consciousness, on love, in any shade that is possible in the, between them. That which is natural is the best way, the straightest way, the highest way, <laughs> the shortest way. Whether our way is, our approach is successful or not depends our sincerity. And then some people come already very connected without being aware of it that they are maybe more connected than others it needs little practice it need, needs little effort and things start to open up and then others they have accumulated quite a burden and it may just take some time to work on that burden and gradually get rid of the obstacles but that is what counts and how we are doing it does not matter at all. So there was that comment that I had come down now from the highest approach because Atma Vichara was not more the main approach, was totally wrong. Ramana didn't recommend many books, but one of the books that he recommended is the Yoga Vasishta. And in the Yoga Vasishta, Vasishta teaches Rama the essence of spirituality in many stories. And there it comes again and again. He says there are the, he says there are the two approaches. Either you do Vichara or you focus on the prana. 
but then he includes in the Nyana approach, the Bhakti approach. Many times it's clear that both aspects are involved. So he says, either you do this or you do that. And Ramana very much recommended that book. So those Ramana people who think that anything that is not Atma Vichara is below, they may remember that Ramana himself was recommending the Yoga Vasishta, which is going on and on, recommending to either the Vichara or focus on the Prana to come back to that essence, to that self-awareness. It is not so difficult. We just have to go about it. And we have to go about it with patience and determination and persistence. That's what is required. Not to gain something, not to achieve something, not to reach something, just to become aware what is. To become aware how much we have in our psyche created obstacles that prevent us from being aware of that natural state of being. That's the essence of all the spiritual approaches. All the other techniques, progressions, categories, levels, they may fascinate the mind. If they help us to connect, fine. If they prevent us from that simplicity, of connecting with the essence, then they are rather a roundabout trip. But eventually, if one sincerely goes about anything, the psyche will clear up and more and more reality will simply shine through. Okay, my friends, I stop talking away over myself. <laughs> <coughs> Is there anybody who would like to come in and say something? You are welcome to come in. Um. Hello. Hello, Maria. Hi. Hi, Hi everybody. Um, I have a very basic question <clears throat> about awareness of the breath. Yes. Be because uh, it's, it is a practice where I feel very much at ease. I like it a lot. That's for me, of course. But um, the instructions are usually that you just stay in, in the place where you feel the breath most. It can be in the, in the nose or in the chest or in the belly. Yeah. And the instruction is just stay in this place. Don't wander around. Yes. But um, in my practice, I feel that uh, I am more at ease if I uh, just follow the breath as it comes through the nostrils and then goes down and down and then how it goes out again. Right. So I wanted to ask, is there any specific reason that uh, the instruction is just stay at one point mm -hmm. or is it also okay to do it like I'm doing it? It's perfectly okay to do it as you do it. If that goes natural and easy for you, then by all means. There is a point in focusing. It helps to keep the attention in the now, in the here. So it's not a bad thing that one finds out for oneself 
where in the body am I centering most naturally? And it can be anywhere. It can be the third eye, it can be the throat, it can be the heart, it can be the belly, it can be on top of the head, <laughs> wherever it's most natural. And then make that in your center. And often also when you practice and also when you are not officially practice, that the, in order to be in the present, it's very helpful then to just focus on that place center consciously and relax but that doesn't mean we have to exclude everything else you can very well have your center and then still feel the breath all the way going in feel the breath all the way going out if that is something that is appealing and natural for you then by all means continue like that and with the awareness of the breath more and more you become also aware that there is much more going on than the air flowing inside and the air flowing outside. But it's a continuous energy, energetic exercise that is happening. And so it's natural that you also become aware of the flow of that energy, like up to the tip of your fingers and your toes. <laughs> You can still have a main center, but uh, if that this is easier for you, then just follow the way of the breath. But you can also try, figure out where you are centering easiest and try to focus and then still from there, observe the breath going in and the breath going out. Okay, okay. Try and see what ha what happens. Yeah, <laughs> but, I will try. But it's certainly nothing wrong what you are doing. You can very well continue. <laughs> no, but I, I resonate with with what you said. Thank you. You're welcome. Ario. 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 It's just right now a wrecked run in front of me over the bamboo looking now down me very astonished what I'm doing here hey you want to come to the sata <laughs> okay he doesn't seem to want to come to here so I ask is there somebody else who would like to come in <coughs> I see, Andreas, you have managed to have a camera this time. Your camera is on. Did you want to come in or have you just the camera on? Uh, now you have to unmute the microphone that I can hear what you are saying. You have to tap on uh, there. Yes. Okay, now I got it. I'm yeah. using my tablet and it's different on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what about obstacles? Obstacles. Like, you said like, yeah, people have to remove their obstacles before they can open up. And I find like my, I think my major obstacle is my occupation with myself and like my... <laughs> Yeah, that I want to be well and want to do it good and oh, and a lot of doubt if I'm doing it correctly or not. Can you say something about that? Yes. A major obstacle, right, is, is being focused on that ID we have of the self. It's not really with yourself, but with the ideas you have about yourself, with your self-image, <laughs> with your self experience as a person. And as long as we are focusing on that, then of course the life is full of little difficulties. There's continuously that tension between the pleasant and the unpleasant, what I want, what I don't want. Simultaneously, I want and don't want the same thing. <laughs> All these tensions that we are creating in the mind like this, they are the obstacles of simply naturally being. 
nothing wrong with eating well if you like to eat well as long as it doesn't become an obsession. If you think, if our mindset is then formed like this, that my well-being is dependent, that I'm eating well, uh, that I'm eating nice food, then of course, we getting dependent on that and whenever it works we feel okay and when we, whenever it doesn't work th then we don't feel okay and creating a lot of unnecessary tensions if we become aware that our well-being is coming out of ourselves out of the source then we can have our little likes and least dislikes on the surface, being aware whether we can fulfill them or not is not important. And then when it's possible, we fulfill it. And when not, then we don't fulfill it. But my happiness, my well-being is not dependent on it. It comes out of the self. Even if I'm fulfilling a desire that I'm having and feel happy about it, that happiness doesn't really come from whatever I did that moment, but because we, in my mind, I'm quite okay with the situation because something nice has happened. So I'm not creating tensions. I'm not resisting against the fact of the experience. And most of the time, people are in resistance. It shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't be like that. Why is this happening? Why me again? And when we fulfill a desire for some time, we let that go. And then that inner joyousness that is there all the time has a chance to come to the surface. And after that, we think I was so happy because I did this and I did that. But the happiness didn't come from that. I simply gave it a chance because what, I, what happened, I liked. And because of that, I relaxed. I didn't resist against the fact of the experience and in that non-resistance the joyousness of existence which is always there came more to the surface and we were happy about it but the happiness comes out of the source out of ourselves and the obstacles is our mental ideas that we are creating what is needed in order to feel happy what is needed in order to feel complete and the more we look at those and let them go, the calmer, the quieter, the simply, naturally joyous we become. And if I don't feel, I mean, one of my main obstacles is if I don't feel so well, I feel that I cannot open up so easily. Right, of is course. It, oh, sorry. Yeah. Is it because I have resistance to not, not feeling so well? Mm. Of course, it's more difficult when the body doesn't feel well, when there is a, an uneasy, a tense feeling there. But we can either consciously make the attempt to accept the situation or we can resist against the situation. And when we resist, then it's becoming bigger and bigger and more difficult. When that feeling comes, no, when that idea comes, the mood comes, no, I'm not feeling well, no, why again, no. And we build up that then it becomes bigger and bigger and more of an obstacle. If we somehow are capable to accept. And accepting doesn't mean to be defeated. Doesn't mean, no, uh, uh, I'm a victim and I cannot do anything. Accepting simply means to accept, okay, now I'm not feeling well. If that acceptance comes, then it doesn't become bigger and bigger. And then maybe because in spite of the uneasy feeling, I'm capable of connecting. And actually, this is the best way 
to give it the chance that that uneasy feeling goes. <laughs> By resisting and fighting with it, we are just making it stronger. <laughs> And on top of that, uh, when there is something that happens, whether it's so-called externally or in my psychophysical manifestation that I don't like, then all the mechanisms of the personality are there. No, 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 no. And to consciously forego that and consciously accept, okay, this is the experience right now. So what? I still can bring the attention back to that source which makes the experience possible. That goes so totally against the usual mechanism of the me, me, me personality who say, no, 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 no. That, I, that very fact of in that situation, having the presence of mind of consciously even attempting to accept that may be a great help that you go really deeply into your own resources. We can attempt to accept. Out of habit, it may not always be so easy. Sometimes we are more successful, sometimes less successful. We may not have the control over it, how successful our attempts are, but whether we are attempt or not, that we can direct. And if we keep on making attempts in that direction, gradually it's getting easier and easier. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And if you don't mind, I'm asking everybody when they are not talking to turn off the camera is there at the, at the bottom, left bottom, there are two icons, uh, one of the camera and one of the microphone. And if you tap on it, then both are turning off. It's simply because it takes less information and my connection is sometimes a bit shaky. So if everybody would have the camera on, we would use about a lot of information. <laughs> That's why I'm asking to rather turn it off. When you tap on, ah, there you are gone. <laughs> okay, is there anybody else who would like to come in? You are welcome. For a moment, I saw Irmgard and Co. Did you want to come in or was that? Not intentional. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so it was not intentional. Is there anybody else who would like to come in? You're welcome. But we just were discussing at the end with Andrea. This actually is, is the big thing, the resistance. And it's good to be clear what it means not to resist. Not resisting is strength. It's not weakness. It's not resigning, thinking, oh, things are bad and I cannot do a thing about it and then slip into a victim mode. <clears throat> we don't have to become victims of the circumstances, no matter what is happening. But sometimes, Circumstances are to our liking, beautiful, joyous. Sometimes the circumstances are 
not to our liking at all. Maybe cruel, sad. And that we can learn not to resist to the fact that the experience is as it is. Not as a victim, oh, it's like this, I cannot do anything. No, just accept here, now. My experience is as it is. It's not a beautiful, not a nice experience. It's still as it is. Even if I resist, it's still as it is. But if I resist, then I'm feeding my energy into it in such a way that I'm creating a lot of tension and that experience, the negativity of the experience becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. But if I can accept, okay, it may be a shitty experience right now, but it is as it is. And I consciously attempt, no matter in what way we are doing that, to turn the attention back to the source, to that which makes the experience possible. Then we become aware also a very unpleasant experience cannot really touch that, cannot really touch the source of our well-being, cannot really touch that which makes us complete. Non-resistance is strength. Sometimes in a situation we may decide it's necessary to stand up, to fight, to declare that we are not okay with what is happening. And then we can still accept, okay, this is the situation. And this is what I feel is the right thing to do, accepting that I'm playing my role in that situation, that I maybe bang on the table and say, no, not like this. <laughs> it may after that work out the way we want, or it may not. If we have that liberty in ourselves, in our heart, then we are free. Then we can play our role according to what we feel is right. But the general tendency is if you are not always <laughs> resisting against facts, then we need, feel the need much less that we have to go and do something about the situation and say to people what is right and what is wrong. <laughs> but if we feel like doing so, we can do so and maybe much more effective. If you are aware, deep down, there is something that is not at all affected by all this that is happening. Actually, it's the resistance against facts that creates all the suffering. When I say suffering, I mean that mental anguish. As long as there is a body, sometimes that body hurts. Sometimes that body is not well. But that's not what I call suffering. It's just part of the physical experience. Sometimes it feels very pleasant. Sometimes it feels unpleasant. That's simply what the body is about. <laughs> But when I call, talk about suffering, then I talk about that anguish that comes out of the resistance against the facts that it shouldn't be like this. Why, why, why is it like this? It's happening again to me. Why, why, why? <laughs> and there we feed our vital force into a loop that makes that experience bigger and bigger and bigger and the unpleasant 
darkness bigger and bigger and that is suffering. And we can learn not to suffer anymore. As long as we are living as a physical manifestation in this world, sometimes it, the situation is pleasant, sometimes it's unpleasant. This is just the nature of this material manifestation. But suffering is not something that we are compelled to do. We simply are compelled by our own habits of dealing with the situation in such a way that we create that mental anguish that comes out of resisting to facts. If we stop resisting, then we are in the flow of life. Sometimes it's exciting, sometimes it's ecstatic, sometimes it's very unpleasant, but deep down there is that awareness, there is a peaceful joyousness unaffected by it. And we can always dive into that with our conscious attention. Okay, my friends, is there anybody else who would like to come in? You're welcome to come in. Vanna? Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want it to take it away from anybody else if anybody else wants to go, but I'm having a difficult time with my uncle. Mm -hmm. He's a very difficult person, like yes. narcissistic, very self-centered, and he kind of trying to exploit me. I lived with him in his house for the last half year and he really took advantage of it. Like I had to work, I mean, I lived in a very small room yeah. and I had to work like 10, 10 hours a week in the garden for it. And he <sighs> wanted me to do more and more. And he was very unfriendly and putting me down in different ways. And yeah. so I got a different apartment and now he's upset with me that I moved out and I'm not helping him so much more, but he's really unkind. And I mean, he, he's, he, he behaves like a seven year old a lot of times. Like if, if I do, don't do something in the way he likes it to, he, he gives negative comments and he's full of negative energy. And it's with any other person I would have said, leave me alone. Like, I mean, there, there are several instances where I thought like anybody else I would say, go away, I don't want to deal with you anymore. But I mean, he has cancer and I'm trying to help him. And on the other hand, he's also probably, I can inherit from him half of his house, which is quite a bit of value. So I don't know what to do really, you know? It's like banging on the table doesn't work. If I bang on the table, then <laughs> the, the, the situation escalates very quickly <laughs> yeah. he gets very upset and it there's no there's no kind of talking to him he has no very little social competences yeah uh, abilities and yeah my approach is to stay calm and stand my point and for a while i haven't done it because i was afraid that he might like give the inheritance the house away to somebody else and i lose it and it's I would, it would be helpful because I don't get very much rent in the end and the house would take solve that problem. Mm -hmm. But right now I'm at the point to say, I, I let go of the house and I don't care. And I, I stand my point in a self-assertive manner and let him, whatever comes out. Mm -hmm. But it, it's really, if, if I get into a... Uh, not in a physical, uh, uh, a verbal fight with him. It's always affecting me very much. And yeah, I think it's because I'm afraid to lose the inheritance, but and, but I don't know what to do about it, basically. Maybe you want to say something about it. Right. Well, have a good look at yourself and see how important this inheritance is for you. Maybe 
of course, it's a nice idea that you're inheriting eventually something, but uh, who knows how long it will take? Who knows how much uh, stuff you have to take <laughs> on your skin for that? And you can wonder, is it worth the trouble? You can really look at the situation and then look at yourself. What are you really feeling in your heart about it? Do you just want to take a distance and think, okay, I have gotten enough humiliation there? Or do you want to keep it, but then look at the situation as a challenge, as, a, as an exercise? as a possibility to, to have always this challenge of unpleasant situations coming and then consciously working with them, consciously dealing with them and think, okay, today I'm going again for the work, for the <laughs> exercise. And, and then you don't take it so serious when it's when, when there are differences and when you maybe get into a verbal fight and defend your point. So I'm not saying to you, do this or do that, but just have a good, honest look at yourself and see what you think is the right way, what you feel deep down and not so much with the had calculating, uh, oh, maybe I'm losing this, maybe I'm losing the inheritance, but what do I really honestly feel about it? And if you honestly also feel, but uh, I mean, he's my uncle, he's an old poor chap who is sick, so it's worth that I'm supporting him, even if he is a rascal, how <laughs> he is treating me, then you can do what the, the practice that acceptance. Okay, he is as he is. And I go there and I don't expect him to be friendlier than he is. And if, he don't, if you don't expect him to be friendlier, then it's already easier to accept that he is unfriendly. And then you can still insist on points where you think he's totally off the board and it's completely wrong, but he insists and says, no, look, if you want me to continue to help you, we are doing it like this. And then let him steam about it. <laughs> so the, the, two, the two positive solutions are either you think, no, I mean, okay, I just, I just give up the whole thing and say, okay, I'm, I don't mind, I don't care and go my own way. Or then you accept, okay, I continue, but you, you stop resisting against the fact that your uncle is the way he, as he is. But then, okay, don't expect him to be more mature don't expect him to be kinder. Don't expect anything, but don't let him uh, trample down on you if you don't want to. If he asks you to do things and you feel, okay, I can do it, fine. And if he asks you to do things and you feel, no, that's too much, then you tell him, no, I won't do it. You have to find another solution. And then you, you learn to be a bit playful about it. And then every situation with him can become like uh, a challenge that you consciously accept, a challenge to learn more about yourself, to become stronger yourself, to use the challenge, to use the unpleasantness of the situation to dive deeper into your own resources. So this is the second positive way to go about it. A negative way to go about it is to continue the same thing and always think, oh, it's so terrible. It really pisses me off. <laughs> I don't want that. And always feel miserable about it. That is a negative way to continue the thing. <laughs> 
I mean, I, I can accept my uncle as, as he is. I mean, it was kind of a learning process to see how, how really egoistic he is. Yeah. But I, I got that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, that he's, and he's very ma manipulative. Yeah. Uh, and some of the things he said to me are so ridiculous that it was easy to just like not take it personally. Right. But the thing I do, that I don't like about it is that I'm always getting, I'm getting, I don't like fights, uh, yeah. like even ver I mean, verbal fights, like yeah. dis intense discussions so much. And he's doing this all the time. And yeah, I, it really is, I don't like that, you know, cause I, for example, last week I had a nice week. Then I went to him, helped him for two hours in the garden. And at the end, he got like very, I mean, very aggressive. And yeah. this, this, keep, this worked in me for the whole week, basically. And yeah. uh, so that's the point that I don't like, that I, it's, I find it really difficult to let it go and um, mm. be at ease with it. Right, but then it's still uh, the resistance against the fact that in this situation, your feeling was, now I came to him, was kind, helped him for two hours, and at the end, he was pouring all that shit on me <laughs> as, as a reward. And then you can also take this lightly and think, well, <laughs> the old fellow is just the way he is. So I need not to take this personal at all. Huh? Or you can uh, go and tell him, listen, I'm ready to come and help you, but after that you behave. You don't be, behave like this, otherwise I'll stop coming and helping you. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it was basically because he threatened me. To, he said that I shouldn't come back at all because oh. he was upset about that. I only come once a week now. Like <laughs> He wants yeah. me to come, I don't know, twice, three times a week. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, this maybe this threat was that the thing that put me off. Uh -huh. Right. The, now you just find for yourself. But um, as I said before, I'm not going to tell you do this or do that. But uh, if you detach from the whole situation and don't hold on to the idea, but uh, I have to do this, then I can maybe gain something from it later. But detach more and then let it come as it comes. And then uh, in a situation like this, you may tell to him, okay, if you are not happy with me coming once a week and don't want me to come, then I don't come until you call me again. Let's see how long he's waiting until he calls you again. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Anyhow, uh, the main thing is not to take it so serious. Huh? Let him be the way he is and don't take him, right, don't take it personal if he's unjust and, and whatever. Huh? The justice trip is also something that we have to get, uh, the justice trap, uh, we have to detach from it. Because in so many situations, we can feel, but it's unjust. But never mind. Uh, it may be unjust, but it's a possibility for me to learn more about myself, to become stronger. And then what does it matter whether on this level it's just or it's not just, whether it's right or it's not right. <laughs> yeah, I learned quite a bit this summer about myself. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> so maybe it's a good field to continue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Thank shall you. we leave it at that? <laughs> yes. Hario, hario, hario. <laughs> Is there anybody else who would like to come in? You're welcome. I saw we are also this time, not so many people, but still, you're welcome to come in. Anybody from those who are here? It's good to remind ourselves 
again and again. That's what we came here for. This world is a matrix. It's a magic show. And we, like many other individual consciousness, they tune into this show. Why? In order to get the experience. Through the experience, learn, become stronger, to grow, to outgrow. So this is the main purpose why we are here, day after day, hour after hour. And in difficult situations, if we can remember that, then the difficulty of the situations already disappears to a large extent. Then we can accept, all right, now this is a challenge, this is a difficult situation, this is an unpleasant situation. But I decided somewhere, my being decided to at least project an aspect of itself into this matrix. To have that opportunity, to have those challenges. And dealing with those challenges in a positive, creative way brings a lot of strength, drives the attention deeper into our own self. You, as a divine being, are as you are, essentially ever pure, ever joyous, ever complete. And yet, there is that being that wants to experience this purity, this beauty, this divinity. And the experience of that essence keeps on unfolding and unfolding. And to come into this world is a wonderful opportunity to have continuously possibilities to grow, to unfold, to become stronger. And in that increasing strength, there, that experience of that sense is unfolding. And the manifestation of consciousness, of energy, of love is unfolding. It's good to tell ourselves again and again, hey, that's why I'm here. That's what I have come for. Even if we at times get totally absorbed in the story and forget it, then it's good when the memory comes back to remind ourselves, hey, this is the main point. This is why I'm here. And if that is getting stronger and clearer, that understanding, then it becomes easier and easier to deal with difficult situations because we can then more and more see everything in that light. Okay, now Moski. Does anyone want to say something? You are welcome.
Okay, then you want me to talk. <laughs> now here in Tiruan Namalai, the Tea Pum Festival has started. It will go on for 10 days. It's a religious festival. Telling about the infinity of Shiva, of the greatness of Shiva, the supremacy of the light, as at the 10th day in the evening, the light is being lit on the mountain top and it will burn after that for days together. Depends how much key they are carrying up. Many people get inspired by religious ceremonies. And sometimes Westerners ask me, but is it necessary to go into that? Do we need to perform all these religious rites? Do we know, need to go into religious ceremonies? Do we need, now as Westerners, to, to do all what the Indians, the Hindus do here? And of course, we don't need to do any of those things. For many people, for the large majority in society, this kind of established rituals and celebrations, they are a help to a call to remember a bit more divinity, to remember a bit more the essence. And so they fulfill their purpose. But we don't need to do anything like that if we don't want to. What is needed is that as long as the attention is not in conscious touch with the essence, we have to somehow or other bring it back. And we can do that with very simple practices directly without going in any religious ceremonies, without going in any religious teachings. And I'm talking now about the organized religions. Doesn't really matter which one. There is always that essence that is there and there's a lot of dogma and ceremonies around it. If one feels comfortable in that, we can follow that and do whatever needs to be done. Whatever we feel like doing, like this now on this festival, so many people will come at the end on the 10th day, there will be millions, most probably, millions of people coming to Tiro and Namalai and that creates a certain energy, that creates a certain festivity that helps people to connect to some extent. We can join in if we feel, if we resonate with that, or we can stay out of such things totally. It's not a must. And especially Westerners who come here and then think, oh, I should also uh, do all this. I should do this puja, I should do that. If they feel like doing so, let them do so. But not with the idea I need now to become like the people here and follow their customs of ritual and religious celebrations in order to get somewhere spiritually. If one feels like doing so, fine. Then one does it joyously, happily, and it may help to connect and bring something, uh, some nice feeling in the current. But if one doesn't feel like joining any of those, then one need not think that one is missing something. One need not have a bad conscience and think, oh, I'm just not interested in a, any of this. This is maybe not good. It doesn't matter at all. What matters is that we learn to connect here now.
and learn to relax in that. And that we can with the help of any religion or if not connecting with any particular religion at all, specifically, for you are that divinity that is worshipped in all religions. And we can come back to that divine essence, even if we're not pulling any religious ceremonies. Still, the festivals are there, people are coming, they are happy that they can come and celebrate, so that's a great thing. <laughs> Just when I started to talk, talk now, I saw that you came in again, Andreas. You wanted to say something else. You are welcome. If nobody else comes in, you are welcome to come in. <laughs> um, first, I wanted to ask about the matrix that you're talking about, but now I can ask about like, I feel that the opening up for me is very dependent on the on the situation like that the which i'm un, unconsciously constructing in a way mm -hmm. that it's very hard for me to do a self retreat for example i'm asking my, myself should i come to india mm -hmm. or it's so complicated with corona and my job and everything that i thought maybe i stay here and do a self retreat but i really find it difficult to fight to to set up to get into the right mind mood for that and so i find i'm very dependent on the exter the external situation is really influencing my capacity to capacity to open up and i really don't know what to do about it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> then if you don't know in your head what to do about it then Listen to your heart what to do about it. Whether you want to take the trouble to come back to India <laughs> or whether you want to maybe do a retreat somewhere there in the environment, in a retreat center, or whether you want to do a light retreat all by yourself. <laughs> but you say you don't really have the mind for doing that. so. Maybe you don't need to do a special retreat. It helps if you keep, even if you are busy, and especially if you live in a world that is rather uh, trying to pull the attention away from being self-aware. It helps very much if, if you just take every day some time where you are retreating with yourself that you are not busy with anything but consciously conscious consciously bringing the attention back to the essence as good as you can and then bring it as good as you can in your daily life in the environment but if you feel the need for retreating then you can still check out more your feelings then what you think about it. Should I go and spend some time in a retreat center or any center where you feel more inspired to stay with it? Or then maybe whether you want to come back again here for some time. <laughs> I mean, in the Ramana Ashram, I can focus very easily or I get, I get like I can tune in that special energy that is there so yeah. that's always very really helpful um, but how important do you think it is to do like really intensive retreats because I mean I sit every day for an hour but I haven't done an intense retreat since I've been in Tiruvannamalai three or four years ago, mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm doubting right now that like doing intense meditation is really what is, um, oh yeah, helps me to really 
realize my nature. People are different. If you are a natural meditator, then that's the way to go about it, to do intense meditator, uh, meditation. But if you are not uh, like that meditator type, then I think you're doing fine, doing one hour a day. And you ask, how important is it to do this kind of intense retreats? It is as important as you give it importance. <laughs> If, if you think it is important, then it is important. <laughs> Even if you don't feel too much like doing so. But if you don't think it is important, then it is not important. The, and what is more important that you do your practice time, connect as good as you can, and then bring that attitude as good as you can in all your activities, whatever you are doing that also the rest of the time you, re you remind yourself whenever it comes, the memory comes to connect here now and relax in that. As long as we don't remember, nothing can be done. But when the memory comes, then at that moment, immediately just turn the attention back to the source and relax. And if we do that consequently in our active time, then the memory comes more and more back, more frequent. And it helps very much if we have every day some time where we are just uh, focusing totally on that. But that doesn't mean you have to necessarily now go somewhere and spend some time where you're doing that the whole day long. You can very well have continue with your balanced practice as you are doing it now that you have your time where you are meditating and, and then you have your time where you are uh, enjoying yourself and then you are doing your work and being with people and whatever. Hmm. But do it consciously. Do it with the remembrance of what I said before. You are here to learn, to grow. We can learn and grow very happily, joyously, playfully. We don't have to, because of that uh, idea that we have to come to learn, think, oh, we have to go now uh, very, <laughs> very tense and serious about our day. No, we can learn to do that very joyously, playfully. I come from a Buddhist tradition, and like in the first years, it seemed like, I mean, or there was this like maybe unconscious notion that intense retreats are very important, mm -hmm. like they do in Vipassana and so on. And like, like certain Vipassana uh, meditators, like, yeah, they, they, it, it, they really try to do very intense retreats. But a lot of times I got um, up tense there. I got very tense and so it didn't work too well. And the retreats, like when it was a more loose atmosphere worked better. But right now I'm really asking myself, is this, this is even the right approach in a way that, cause like I feel more that like you said, like the opening up is important. And like, if I read in the Buddhist text about people who, who get enlightened, there's very little when they say like they meditated very intensely and then they get enlightened. It, they get enlightened in that much more daily life situations. So I'm really asking myself, I mean, first I had the idea that I can like meditate myself to enlightenment and now I don't think so anymore because there's just <laughs> way, way too much me in it. Um, yeah. And I mean, even your story, you said you're like, you're like it worked. It, it happened for you when you gave up everything and all the meditation that you did was as far as I understood you more of to, to really give up and like give up all the controls and ideas. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so I'm really asking myself how, how yeah, you, I mean, you said basically already that, I mean, if I'm kind of a meditator, then I should do it, but I'm, I'm like in between, I like meditation, 
Yeah. But if I'm getting very easily tense, tensed up, if the situation is is too narrowly constructed or my, my health isn't very good. And if I don't move a certain amount in a day, my stomach gives me troubles and like, so it gets you. Yeah, so maybe you want to say something. No, I think you already gave you yourself the answer that uh, maybe that's not what you need now. <laughs> so uh, if you really, from what you say, it's obvious, you really feel like that, that it's not what you have to do now, then you don't have to construct that ID and hold on to the ID in the head because you have it from the past uh, that the, these intense retreats are necessary. They may be very helpful, but if the one who goes for the retreat really wants to go and feels like going to do so, they may be very helpful. But if one goes because one thinks, oh, actually, uh, I don't want to go, but it must be helpful, then I don't think much, much good comes out of it. <laughs> so continue with your program that you're having. Do your meditation and then keep that spirit as good as you can for the rest of the time. How important is joy in that? Joy makes it easier. If we are going through our life joyless, then everything becomes so heavy and hard. But the joy uh, is there. We just have to let it come. It's not ever really absent. Joy, joyousness is an aspect of your being. It's just a question whether we have the habit of always suppressing it and not letting it come to the surface or whether we learn to let it come to the surface. And if we learn to do so, then everything becomes easier. <laughs> It's not that we have to try to artificially be joyous, make, make a big fuss and uh, show about joyousness, but sincerely, whether we learn to let go and feel that joyousness of existence come up, then uh, just everything is easier to deal with in, from moment to moment in the daily life. Hmm. I feel a lot of joy in the when I sit in the small meditation room in the Ramana Ashram. So mm -hmm. that's the reason why I, I come there a lot of times. And mm -hmm. but sometimes I'm I'm really not very f even focused, but but I can really tune into that that vibration what is there. And I'm always asking myself, what kind of vibration is that? <laughs> <laughs> can you say something about that? Well, it's a place Ramana has been sitting there for quite some time, and it has a bit uh, created a certain atmosphere. And then now he's not there since uh, 70 years <laughs> physically, but people come and tune in. So uh, naturally, it creates a certain energetic support that makes it easier to connect. At the same time, everything has always two sides. It's these places where many people go and meditate, then uh, of course there is also a certain struggle there of people who are trying to connect. So it has, in meditation halls, it has both. It has that energetic support to connect with the essence because many people come for that purpose, but then in the process of connecting a lot of stuff comes up and so uh, that also is there and so in that intensity of a place like this one can maybe for some time uh, it's easy to tune into the joyousness but then uh, there may also be periods where there are lots of stuff will come up because of the intensity of the place. And we have to deal with that of stuff that is still hooked somewhere in the subconscious. 
I've experienced that first time I came to Tiruvannamalai in 81 from Amas Ashram. And then every morning I used to go up in Virupaksha cave, which is also a very special place for meditation. It has a very special atmosphere. And so I went and sat there every day for hours in that Virupaksha cave. But cool, how much stuff came up there. <laughs> how much it started to boil. The, on one hand, it was easy to connect. It, uh, it's easy to connect with that peacefulness, but then because of that peacefulness, going deeper, going deeper, uh, you also open up stuff that is deep in the subconscious and then that also comes up. <laughs> so both is happening uh, in places like this, in a meditation hall. For, for some time, a period, it may feel, ah, in this place, it's, uh, it's easy to tune into the joyousness. But if you stay longer and keep on going, then sometimes there may also be a period where the opposite is happening. Uh, and a lot of unpleasant stuff may bubble up. This ha didn't happen for me so far. Maybe it's still coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, do as you feel like. Uh, more as you feel in your heart than less than what you calculate in your head, whether to come or not to come. <laughs> Whether you go for a retreat or not to go for a retreat. It's a bit again the same situation like before with the uncle and the inheritance. Calculate less about gain, but listen to what feels right in your heart. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Is now anybody else who would like to talk? If we want, we have a little more time. Okay, let's for a moment just be here together in that meditative state. What does it mean, that meditative state? That means the attention consciously is connecting with the essence. Instead of always going somewhere and looking for kicks. So let's just for a moment make use of the energy that we have been building up in this subtle space, even if we are physically in many different places, we are meeting energetically and we can help each other, support each other. Like what Andrea said in that meditation hall, we felt it easier to connect with the joyousness of existence. So everyone in their own way can sit in a comfortable position and be, be conscious, be consciously conscious, consciously alive. consciously connected with all there is. And when it's getting quiet, the thoughts may bubble up, thinking of problems that have happened, problems that are waiting, we have to face, and we need not get interested in that at all right now.
See the thoughts, see the emotions, they come, they go, but here, now, timelessly, I am. The sense of presence, the sense of consciously being alive, the sense of loving connection with everything is something that we don't have to produce. If we don't disturb, it's simply here. There's nothing to get tense about it. Here now. It's totally safe. <laughs> There's nothing to be afraid of. In the relativity, in the stories, all kinds of threatening things may happen. It doesn't reach here. When we go out in our activities, it's good to remember moments like this. Remembering it's always there, even if our attention has disconnected from it. It's good to have every day some time where we are doing nothing else. And it's very helpful if also during the rest of the time, we make little moments like this, where we just stop for a moment, consciously breathe and relax. Consciously bring your attention back to the source of awareness. I wish you all well. Are you all? Are you? Are you?